Grace Ke Gabriel has been a champion of wildlife for over 20 years. She is the Asian Regional Director for the International Fund for Animal Welfare, or I4, one of the largest animal welfare organizations in the world. Before becoming an activist, Grace had a promising career in broadcast journalism, both in China and the United States. She was a producer at China Central Television and a senior news editor at KSL TV, an NBC affiliate in the United States. Grace was producing a program about rescuing bears from bile extraction farms when she witnessed the suffering the bears endured, and decided she must devote her life in helping animals. She gave up her career in journalism to become a protector of wildlife and joined the organization responsible for rescuing the bears, I4. Since then, Grace has been instrumental in animal welfare in China. Grace founded the Beijing Raptor Rescue Center, which rescues and rehabilitates birds of prey in China, the first of its kind in the country. Grace also initiated anti-poaching operations to protect Tibetan antelopes, even going undercover in operations to arrest dealers in animal skins. She has also created programs to protect elephants from the ivory trade, and has been instrumental in developing China's first animal welfare law. We caught up with Grace in our studio in Beijing to talk about her career in animal welfare. Well, a very good afternoon to you, Grace, and welcome to Icon. And we have a full display of all these dolls over here. I see two elephants over here. This is a seal. This is a seal.、Mm -hmm. It's a baby, baby it's a seal, baby just like seal. that one. Just like that one. How two, old is? Two weeks old. Two weeks old. And what is this one? That's a pangolin.、Uh -huh. Pangolin is a mammal, right? And it's the world's most trafficked mammal. Okay. Then over there we have elephant. We have that's Tibetan antelope. Correct. So we have all these animals. We'll talk about all these animals. Lots of stories to share with you. Uh, but first of all, you used to work for CCTV as a journalist, as a producer, as an anchor for how long?、Uh, for two years. For two years.、Mm -hmm. I worked in the international department. I、mm. graduated from Beijing Broadcasting、uh, Institute, and I was assigned to work at CCTV.、Mm. I liked it, but I also want to get higher education. So I went to the U.S. to get my master's in communications. But somehow, you, you're now doing what you're doing for.、Mm -hmm. Over 20 years already. So, what made you make that change? I was working、uh, in a U.S.、Uh, television station,、mm. but、um, I had the、uh, privilege to know、uh, the founder of an organization that saved seals, which is the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Right. The the organization actually started with saving、uh, seals, seals from in Canada,、mm. and at the time.、Um, I thought assigned me to come back to China to film the opening of a bear sanctuary in Guangdong,、uh -huh. China, because bears are farmed for their bile. Bear bile is used as an ingredient in traditional Chinese medicine,、mm. and so that's why people kept bears. They catch bears from the wild and keep them in tiny cages, insert a catheter into their stomach. So that they can extract bile every day. IFA has already persuaded the Guangdong Forestry Bureau to、mm. close two of the worst condition bear farms, and then released nine bears to our care.、Mm. And seeing these bears coming out for the first time, and they have even forgotten how soil feels like, how grass feels like. How grass smells, and that first day, this one bear, moving on the the、uh, stone path back and forth, back and forth, every time he put his paw on the grass, and it was like electrocuted. And then he pulls it back, and I just it it just touched me so much, and I was thinking, what. Are we doing to animals? So at the time you were still a journalist sent、yes. by the TV from the US. Yes. But it was a project working with、uh, I4 at the time. That day, the, the the moment that bear stepped into the grass, 
took his first step into freedom, I became an activist. I stopped being an observer. I just felt I cannot be an observer alone anymore. So let's come back to all these animals over here. We have two elephants over here. I guess you're going to talk about the ivory trade. Yeah. It's now been totally banned in China. No, it's not. It's not yet. It's not it's, yet. It's, it's still it's legal. It's still、then. legal.、Mm. Yeah, there is legal market in China still. Not、um, not newly sold after、uh, ivory products. I mean, the, the stock、um, ivory products they can sell, but not the new ones. Uh, correct. But who's going to be able to tell? You can't really tell, right? No, no. <laughs> in fact, the legal market for ivory is a cover、mm. for illegal traders. In 2011, one trader who has a legal ivory store,、mm. and this one trader smuggled seven tons of ivory from Africa, and he can hide under under the cover of his legal store. He was able to launder and make the illegal ivory from poached elephants, and became legal. Basically, he he sell it as a legal. Ivory, in the 70s and 80s, there is a huge demand for ivory from Japan, and that market in Japan prompted the killing of hundreds of thousands of elephants. Actually, African elephant population reduced from 1.3 million to fewer than 600,000. So, in 1989. There is an international convention called CITES. It's Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. China is also a member. Currently, there are 185 countries that are member to the convention. And this convention decided elephant products or or parts are completely prohibited from international trade. A total ban. A total ban. And in fact, when the trade ban happened, instantly the message sent to the market. Um, was ivory trade is forbidden. If you trade, you're going to be punished, and the price dropped. So there is no more incentive for poachers to go kill elephants, and elephant population started to recover. But that ban was short-lived. In 1997, and then in 2007, CITES allowed two one-off sales. Of ivory,、mm. one the 97 one-off sale was only to Japan, and 2007 trade was to China and Japan, and unfortunately, that second both one-off sale actually confused consumers. The minute you allow ivory trade, consumers didn't know it. It it's. There is actually a ban. It's not allowed to trade,、mm-hmm. and it's only the small proportion of ivory is allowed to trade because of the market demand in in China and、mm. in Japan. Poachers killed 100,000 elephants in three years. So a total ban of ivory products, traditional, not traditional, old ivory, new ivory, nothing at all. Nothing is available or allowed in this market. Do you think that's the solution? If you leave legal loopholes, is there are a lot of people for commercial for for profit margin? They are going to exploit those legal loopholes. If we look at elephant ivory, there is a very similar、mm. product which affect a species that's in China,、mm. which is Tibetan antelope, and that's for scarves. Because Tibetan antelope is a species that live only in China. There is a very small population lives in India, but、mm. mostly in China, and they were poached by the tens of thousands because poachers want a little bit of fur under the Tibetan antelope chin,、mm. and three to five Tibetan antelope killed can produce one scarf. And poachers take the wool. Smuggle them into India, and then they weave them into a shawl, and then they sell that shawl into the Western market, the luxury market. It's called shatush, 
and it, it's, uh, it's light, it's warm, it can go through a ring, so it's also called a ring shawl. And because of that market in the West, it's threatening the survival of a species that's in China. So our world has been interlinked already. Exactly. So that's why one of the first campaigns IFAR conducted in China was to save Tibetan antelope. We worked at every link on the chain. In China, we supported anti-poaching. We supported the Wild Yak Patrol. We supported setting up enforcement network among the three nature reserves where Tibetan antelope the migrate. Su the supply end. The supply end. And then we also work in India we shifted an entire industry, weaving shatush mm. into using a product, a, a type of wool that can be sheared from a, from a mountain goat. Mm. So this is the and processing this, end. Exactly. This shawl was used a mountain goat <laughs> woven in that region. 30,000 people who are living um, weave, um, um, in this industry. Feels so equally feels good, right? Feels equally good, equally yeah, good. I was wondering whether this it, is actually a product of an animal. <laughs> no, 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 of course not. But I, I did, I did go undercover at one point. You did? I did, I did. And that was in India? In India. When you were a journalist or you already no, started? No, when I was working for IFA. I was in India um, and our partner, Wildlife Trust of India, um, the minute I arrived, they uh, the director, Ashok Kumar, and asked me, Grace, would you like to participate in an investigation? <laughs> we have found that a trader in India mm. has been shipping Chatouche to Switzerland. And he has a, a hub in Delhi. Mm. And he says, would you like to pose as a buyer? and go negotiate with him on price and see how many shawls you can get him to show you mm. and then we will have an operation. They, they did send a policeman also going undercover. He's my guide. Uh -huh. And so we went to this trader's house. He has two rooms and the front room piled up as high as tall as me uh, with shawls but not, not all uh, Chatouche. Chatouche is hidden inside mm. and you know I said I'm going to buy and he brought the wool out and actually I went there twice and the second time because the first time he didn't have as many so I said okay why don't you you know bring more and then the next time before I leave I'm going to come and get collect. So you successfully, successfully collected evidence for their crimes. And, the and the police stormed his house and arrested him. It would make a, a very good TV program, but at the same time, by doing that, you put yourself in great danger. I felt that um, the danger that I was in is nowhere near the people who are on the ground protecting Tibetan antelope or elephants or any animal from poachers' guns. I guess with the seals, it's the similar story, especially yes. with baby seal. Because only with a baby seal, two weeks young, two weeks old, they would have a uh, layer of the, uh, the fur like this. Right. I thought, actually, it was founded on the, on the campaign to, to save uh, seals. Mm. Our founder in, um, found that there is a huge slaughter for commercial exploitation in the Newfoundland area and east coast of Canada. Mm. Every year in the spring, around March, harp seals would come to the ice like this to, to give birth to their babies. Mm. And they have to give birth on the ice. And then when the baby's born, they have this white fur. Mm. And this white fur hunters kill them just for the white fur and then they sell it to to Europe to the European markets also seen as luxurious items it, yeah yeah as for clothing and so our founders set up the organization campaign to save this species and eventually when the year peace returned to the ice mm. in the mid 1990s was because EU market stopped importing seal pelts. So yet again, actions need to be taken by the authorities 
yes. either a European organization or a country like China itself, then when there is no demand in the market, yeah. there is no killing. Yes. There, there used to be a lot of them in uh, China. In the wild. It's an ant eater, mm. and it's actually it's a mammal. If it's threatened, what it does, it it's roll up into a ball mm. because it has the, the kind of a hard scale. Mm. So it roll up into a ball, thinking it's going to. Be prevent safe. it yeah. be safe mm. but of course it's not safe from people <laughs> and hundreds and thousands and millions of pangolins are being traded today for what well in china pangolin scale was also one ingredient in traditional chinese medicine seriously yes but today pangolins are used for meat people eat pangolin meat People just also, for the taste of it? Just for the taste of it. Just for the taste of it. Up. Not just China, mm. Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Southeast this Asian Southeast countries. Asia, it is happening all over. And also in China, people are using the scale for carving. It's not even for medicine, not, not even for health anymore. That's something new? Yeah, it's new. Interesting. And Chinese pangolins are be, have be already become extinct. Mm. So the demand is, has been in the last 30 years have been threatening pangolin populations in Asia, in Southeast Asia. Mm. And then when that population is depleted, the, the, the demand now is threatening po pangolin populations in Africa. And that's why at the conference... Because it's not enough. They cannot find enough pangolins, pangolins here in Asia. Yes. No more. No more. It's disappearing, the species. So any disappearing. Actions, any actions being taken now? At the CITES conference in Johannesburg in South Africa, 183 parties decided that international trade of pangolins is completely banned. That decision, if it stays on paper, it means nothing. nothing. It means nothing. Mm. It has to be implemented. It has to be implemented. Laws have to be enforced. And only when you have clear policy, now that policy is international trade is banned, domestic trade have to be banned. Uh, China and other Asian countries included? Yes. It has to be banned. And it, it has they, to be have they not yet, it? not yet. Mm. Well, it, 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 domestic legislation change requires uh, each, each sovereign nation mm. needs to do that, you know, to, in order to, to be in line with CITES decision. But, I mean, people are so stubborn about their eating habits. They say, we've been eating this for a long time. This is our tradition. Uh, we can't really change it or it's relative unfair for us to change it. How would yeah. you comment on that? In 2003, SARS came from civet cats caught in the wild being sold from the market in Guangdong. Mm. I don't know if you have ever been to a wildlife market. No. It's, <laughs> it's a hotbed for disease, for spreading disease. Right. And that's, that, that was exactly what happened. And there is also lots of diseases that occur in animals, but it can also jump to people, mm. including, you know, there, there have been a lot of uh, bird flu cases, mm. right? And, and that's, that's why we have to be aware that this type of eating habits, uh, these animals, the way you are trading, the, the way you're catching the animals from the wild, the way you're eating it, it there is no regulation, there is no sanitation standards. There is, and all of that is posing uh, a, a risk to human health. That's right. So and, this is... And also, uh. also, when SARS happened, 
imagine how much that disaster caused GDP, That's China's true. GDP. Okay, let's move on to uh, another project, a very important project of this one, Raptor Rescue Center. Actually, you helped uh, establish this center mm -hmm. in Beijing, based in one of the universities. Yeah. So how is it going now? It's going very well. Yeah, the center was established in 2001. It's a collaborative effort between IFA with uh, Beijing Free Bureau and Beijing Normal University. Mm. And Beijing Normal University provided us the space. It's on the campus of Beijing Normal University. Mm. And in the last 15 years, we have received over 4,000 Raptor patients. Where did you get them? Where did you find them? They come from markets. Some it's sometimes for sale. sometimes people yeah. Is people, it legal or illegal? People catch it in the wild and sell them in the market. It's all illegal. It's all illegal. It's all illegal. But, but yet still it's still happening. Yes. So once again this yes. is a more about the awareness about but it also about law, law enforcement. enforcement. When law enforcers uh, crack down on markets and they confiscate the birds they they bring them to the center. And also, a lot of the birds come from uh, well-meaning citizens, people who saw injured raptor, mm. and they call us and, and bring the raptor to us. So once again, and thanks so to your efforts, people are now realizing it is important to send them to the right place yes. to be rescued. Yes. Otherwise, people wouldn't have the knowledge to help them. To help them, exactly. And out of the 4,000 patients that we received, 57% of them have returned to the, to the sky. And when we say return them to the sky, uh, do you need also some uh, professional skills and knowledge to do that? The right uh, we, we know the, the species uh -huh. and the raptor has to be fit to live in the wild. I saw some pictures when sometimes you release them actually in the evening when it's all dark correct, outside. Correct, correct. Well, depending on the species, right. if the species is nocturnal, we release the bird in the evening See. because that way the 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 bird the the just coming out from you know the the rescue, rescue center, center he needs time to adjust to the environment See. he also by uh, adjusting to the environment he will be able to catch uh, prey in order to live the mm. first 24 hours for this bird is very important mm. You know, the, the reason I set up the center was because I recognized that there is no center in China that was able to absorb and help the raptors that are confiscated by law enforcement. And also there are well-meaning people who don't know how to help care them. for, help them. That's they right. want to help them, but they don't know how. There's a recent a story, a recent reporter about a guy in China who actually somehow uh, captured some raptors or, or all these wild birds and then he was called by law enforcers by police and he was sentenced I don't know for how many years in jail but he was punished and mm -hmm. people would say well that is really very serious punishment mm -hmm. imprisonment mm -hmm. what do you think I think it's correct I think because it, it means it means government is increasingly recognize the importance of addressing wildlife crime because wildlife crime has long been a, a non-priority you know mm. there there are many competing priorities for law enforcement for government policies and they felt that wildlife crime yeah they don't recognize how important it is mm. but because wildlife crime is a non-priority for law enforcement government wildlife crime became a high profit low risk endeavor mm. and because of that it's attracting uh, criminal syndicates actually into this this crime because they can use the proceeds from this crime to fund other type of violent All crime right. yes to fund terrorism to fund drugs which is causing instability in regions and in countries so around are, the world things are getting more complicated not just yes. the protection of wild animals correct mm. correct and so that's why we we 
really support government to have stronger laws and vigorous enforcement and meaningful penalties. You have to have meaningful penalties to deter this type of crime. If we come back to your personal experience, say, having been in this new area for over 20 years already is not longer than your time spent in journalism, yes. I guess. So yeah. what is most rewarding to you? Most rewarding for me is to see animals in their natural habitat, really. I have seen seals on the ice. Mm. I have seen Tibetan antelope on the Qinghai Tibet Plateau. I have seen elephants in Africa, on the Africa savanna, and I have seen tigers. And I'm, I'm actually- Tigers a, in the in wilderness. In the wild, All in right. the wild, yes. I saw tigers in India. And you know, I felt, even though I felt this power, this tremendous strength that this animal embodies, but at the same time, I felt she was very vulnerable, very, very vulnerable. She could be killed with one drop of poison. She could be killed with one bullet. And, you know, humans are capable of that. Mm -hmm. And I also felt the responsibility that we have to do something to protect them. But I guess it's more about you believe this is the scene of a nature that is supposed to be. Yes, yes. You would like to see I, I, all these animals in their natural situation, natural habitat, living a life that's supposed to be their life. Yes. For them, being in that environment is going to help all of us. You know, it, and, and I just felt tremendous rejuvenation in that surrounding and being there, I am in their world, and I'm tiny. I'm actually tiny. I, I just feel human. I just felt myself was, was tiny. So, uh, doing what you have done for all these years, mm -hmm. do you think you've also changed? My conviction is um, making me stronger, and I felt I need to do what I can mm. as long as I live for them um, because it, this is, this is the, the, the world really is not just, it's not just us. It's not just me, 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 you know, it's, it's, there are so much more out there um, that's part of us. It's about all of us, all creatures living in a wide environment in one nature we all share and right. treasure. Yeah. Okay. Harmony. Yeah. That's the harmony between human beings yeah. and nature. Yes. So once again, Grace, thank you for your time and thank you for tell, telling us your stories. <laughs> thank you for thank having you. me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>